All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to a presentation about uh, how interconnected the hypervisor and um, security solutions are or should be. It's about hypervisor development, uh, teaming up with uh, security solutions development in providing better uh, security for virtual environments. Um, and about our journey of developing both um, a hypervisor and uh, security solution relying on it. Uh, my name is Raul, and with my colleague Daniel, uh, we'll tell you a story about how we got to build a uh, bare metal hypervisor from scratch, only as a um, development environment for our introspection security solution. Uh, for any questions that you may have, uh, there's going to be a Q&A session at uh, the end. Um, so, um, the story starts with, uh, with why. Why some security solutions need uh, dedicated, purposeful support from the hypervisor, and uh, why we had to build our own. It then goes to how we built it with all the support required by the introspection. We will show what all that meant for the Zen project in terms of uh, contributions, and we'll end up with where this entanglement between the hypervisor and the security solutions could go in the future. Um, so everything starts with um, the hypervisor memory introspection technology or HVMI or HVI, I'll be called for short, which is the root of all this uh, deliberation. So HVI is an idea we started implementing a, a long time ago, an idea about a class of security solutions, which as uh, Garfinkel and Rosenblum put it back in 2003, inspect the virtual machine from uh, the outside for the purpose of analyzing the software running inside. Another way of seeing HVI is as a friendly add-on for the hypervisor. Uh, the HV only virtualizes the hardware resources and exposes them to the VM, but doesn't quite understand the operating system and its internals. Um, so it's unable to defend the kernel, for example, from attacks initiated within the VM. So HVI to bridge this semantic gap. It analyzes the raw memory, and identifies which memory zone is what operating system structure and determines uh, what's worthy of having an enforced access policy. Once it identifies these critical regions, it instructs the hypervisor to apply a set of access policies using uh, EPT and also asks it to notify the HVI whenever there's a violation of those policies. Uh, so this would be just a high-level description of uh, what HVI is. Uh, uh, if you want to learn more about it and how it works, there's another presentation on it tomorrow. Uh, my colleagues Andre and Mihai will dive really deep into its inner workings, so I really recommend saving it to your schedule. Um, so um, to be able to enforce the security policies, the HVI and the hypervisor needs to be engaged in some sort of a partnership. And the following section of the presentation is about the terms of this partnership. So uh, here's a list of capabilities that the hypervisor should have for HVI to be compatible with it. For example, there should be some sort of uh, API which allows HVI to query or modify the general purpose registers from the vCPU or to query and modify the EPT access rights and the possibility of being notified when an EPT violation occurs. Now, some of these capabilities are things that any hypervisor is already able to do. For example, injecting an event into a guest. The thing is some of these are not exposed as an API uh, for a third party to use, for example, injecting an exception into a guest is not something that Zen wasn't able to do. It's just that it couldn't be done at the request of the SVA. While other uh, requirements can be considered more exotic, for example, uh, the virtualization exceptions or hash VE, which needed more work 
to extend the hypervisor itself. So um, when we started working on HBI, of course, there was no hypervisor with all, with all this functionality available because no, were, no one ever needed it. And our options were quite limited. One approach could have been to uh, start implementing these features in an open source in an open source hypervisor like Zen, but we had no hypervisor development knowledge at the time, so we couldn't just start patching an existing hypervisor without understanding how we, how it works. So what we did uh, was to have every single member of our team develop their own hypervisor from scratch, including myself. Uh, with the minimum requirement that Windows was able to boot within a VM with a dozen or more working hypervisors. But most important, by then we all had that uh, required knowledge. So we put up all that knowledge to work, redesigned, and built what today we call the Napoca hypervisor. Of course, featuring all the support needed by the HVI. Uh, and as I said, we did this only to have a playground for HVI where we could easily test any wild ideas we had over time. So building this hypervisor actually felt like building an entire city only to run a nuclear plant. And now about the name Napoca. Uh, as you all know, Zen Summit should have taken place this year in uh, Bucharest, Romania. But then the coronavirus happened and all hell broke loose. Well, Cluj Napoca is another city in Romania located right in the heart of Transylvania and where we are actually located. And the old uh, Dacian Roman name of the city is Napoca. So that's where its name comes from. And that is a picture of one of its most iconic buildings. Um, as for the first protection policy ever implemented in uh, the hypervisor, uh, because at the time HVI didn't used to be a separate module, uh, it was the right protection of the driver object structure for two specific drivers. The reason we chose those two was to provide protection against the rootkits uh, of the time. Of course, back then, uh, we could only protect uh, memory pages from the non-page pool. Uh, so um, with this, we've been able to say that uh, with such a solution, we can provide protection against rootkits by detecting, detecting and blocking the rootkit installation attempt. And that validated the concept. So that's how our uh, hypervisor research initiative was born. Uh, the Napoca project being the city and uh, the HVI project, which for many reasons, uh, including its complexity and the deep hardware and software knowledge it requires, one can, could compare it to a nuclear plant. So the big announcement we are making today uh, is this. Um, we are ready to offer Oh, to offer the Napoca hypervisor to the open source community. Uh, July 30, 30th is the date Napoca is going open source. Uh, here is the link where it's a repo and other required repos will, will be available. Uh, there will be plenty of uh, documentation, including how to build and run uh, Napoca. So, yeah, at uh, this point, I will give the floor to my colleague, Daniel. He will dive into some technical characteristics of uh, Napoca. He will review some features now present in Zen, which have been initially implemented in Napoca. And he will discuss another particular capability that is present in Napoca. And uh, we believe it uh, should be replicated in Zen as well. So if Daniel can be made a presenter, the floor is his. Hi, everybody. Let's see if I can change slides. Yep, all seems to be working fine. My name is Daniel. 
I've been working on the hypervisor project uh, for a few years now. It's called them about nine or 10 years. And during this time, I, got a, I gathered a lot of knowledge about uh, low level programming and how uh, Intel CPU works and about hypervisor development uh, as a whole. So as my colleague said, I will go now through the technical details of uh, our uh, Napoca hypervisor. One thing that is worth mentioning is uh, that uh, Napoca is a type one hypervisor. This means that it sits uh, right uh, above the hardware and it controls access to whatever happens on that system. Uh, with respect to this uh, classification and being a type one or a bare metal hypervisor, uh, it has uh, its own uh, environment where it runs. It's completely isolated from the, the guest and that uh, isolation is uh, ensured by uh, hard hardware uh, instructions, mainly by the Intel uh, virtualization extensions. Also, it's isolated by the guest by using its own uh, interrupt uh, descriptor tables and uh, global descriptor tables for data and code. Uh, it, it's also isolated by the VM by using its own memory address space. So there is no, uh, no way that the VM can uh, access uh, the hypervisor memory. So the only things that are common between the hypervisor and the guest is a channel that allows data passing between those two. Data passing means information from the HVI through the to the to the VM to show whatever whatever happens and information to allow configuration and behavior of the hypervisor and the HVI itself. This being said, we can move forward to see what kind of hardware and software we require or we support. Being a relatively long uh, time development project, uh, you can see that we started uh, using something that at that time was the latest Intel CPUs, the second generation uh, core processors, that's been uh, in that's been released in 2011 and since that time we added support for almost all intel releases including uh, the 10th generation of intel processors now in terms of resources of memory resources we have an approach like a flat amount and of course we prefer to have flexibility and since we need that kind of flexibility we decided to add to this flat amount of memory also a percent this two percent does not sound too much and considering the resources available currently in the the systems uh, it gives us uh, let's say enough room to have a decent behavior uh, of the hypervisor and the vm Initially, when we started, it has uh, the system had uh, the legacy um, firmware types, and later on, we had to add the UFI uh, firmware support, and it's proven to be a good choice since uh, late, later and newer systems uh, do not provide um, booting from the local hard drive using the legacy mechanism. So the UFI is a is a uh, supported uh, uh, firmware on the Napoca hypervisor. We had also the secure boot feature in place with proper signing and uh, all the requirements uh, that were uh, enforced by uh, signing authorities. So we we also had the secure boot in place. As a form factor, we targeted the desktops laptops and also two-in-ones and on all these three form factors we had uh, the napoca hypervisor tested and validated and it, uh, it and it works in terms of operating system we have support for windows 7 8 and also 10 
uh, both variants of 32-bit uh, and 64-bit. Uh, also, Linux is supported in an experimental way. We did boot uh, several distributions of Linux, standard distributions with uh, success, but our main focus was on, uh, on Windows uh, operating system. Being targeted on the desktops and laptops and uh, systems that are used uh, every day by uh, users, we had a requirement for power management uh, support, a full power management support, and we have sleep and hibernate on, and also CPU frequency throttling support using both uh, methods, the legacy one and the new one uh, from, uh, from Intel. Okay, let's move on to the next uh, next step. Uh, what is virtualized uh, using Napoca? As you may see in this slide, there are quite uh, numerous hardware resources in a system. But from our point of view, the most important ones that we needed to control and virtualize were the processor and the memory. Everything else is passed through through the hypervisor from the operating system to the hardware. We do not uh, look into deep, very, very much details to other devices because uh, all that we needed is memory and CPU. Also, we had an, a very important uh, and very challenging uh, task in debugging the code and making the hypervisor talk to us. It was easy in the beginning while we used desktop for development because every desktop at that time had a good old uh, serial port exposed and usable. As time goes by, the serial port was considered obsolete and removed from many systems, including laptops and two-in-ones. So we had to do something else to listen to the hypervisor and to talk to the hypervisor for debugging purposes. Uh, just as a side note and a quick uh, info, we went through USB support, we went to uh, SD card uh, support, and uh, even we use the audio jack to dump logs from the hypervisor using the uh, Intel High Definition audio hardware. Measurements in terms of performance and um, behavior of the hypervisor, we have uh, measured two main aspects, the boot time and the run time. As you can see, we use the medium processor and seventh generation in a Windows uh, RS5 uh, release build. And the overhead during the boot time, from the moment the hypervisor starts and initializes and the Windows kernel starts and uh, loads them, all the modules and the HVI also does its job in there, the total overhead is about 15% of the boot time. Now, considering this, uh, in a 10 to 12 uh, seconds boot time, adding one or two seconds is, uh, is uh, reasonable for this uh, approach. Of course, there is always uh, in place for improvement. And during the runtime, while uh, the computer is used for regular tasks like browsing or uh, uh, office uh, processing and stuff like that, uh, the CPU overhead uh, at its peak may reach about around 3%, but in general is less than that. I chose to put the, an, an average and medium high uh, percent of overhead here just to be on the safe side. In general use, it's about uh, 0 0.5 to 1% overhead uh, added by the HVI and the hypervisor itself. One of the most challenging parts of our development was the communication. And when I say communication, I mean interprocessor communication. Interprocessor communication is something that we needed in order to have uh, some features like uh, invalidations and uh, TLB shutdown that were required by the HVI introspection, HVI engine. And our first approach was to fully virtualize the, the system. Interrupts and everything else was virtualized, and it proved pretty complex uh, to have it reliable, uh, a reliable functionality on this one. 
after many attempts, including the uh, non-maskable interrupts approach, uh, we were in a delicate situation and the project was uh, on the edge of being shut down until some of uh, my colleagues came with an interesting idea by using something that never, that nobody has ever used before to communicate between processors for these reasons. And we used init signals. You know that init signals are used to start up the AP processors during the boot. And from that moment, they are less used by a normal operating system or a, or a, or a platform. Now, we needed this in order to have a interprocessor communication that causes unconditional exits while the CPU is in non-root mode. We, we did this because um, uh, the init is documented that it, it's delivered at the very next instruction boundary. So the very next instruction boundary is the moment where we unconditionally exit from the guest, whatever the guest is doing, and we gain control in the hypervisor. And there is no block by semantics as you can have for interrupts or other things. It's not, it, it does not interfere with the exception and guest interrupts mechanism. There's no need for external interrupts. There's no need for visualizing the local APIC controller or, or other uh, interrupt controllers. And it avoids all the complexity in, in uh, handling time sensitive uh, operations. Now, this being said, we needed that the hypervisor is able to uh, get gain control of a CPU and make made the, the CPU exit only when it was absolutely needed. So we need to minimize the number of exit. And we also had a requirement that the OS cannot inhibit that kind of exit. Now, this is the communication saga that we had. Now, I would like to go through our contribution from Napoca to Zen, things that were implemented to Zen uh, as a consequence of the, of, uh, of, uh, the need in, in, in Zen. And you can see here that we had to add uh, support for hash VE, support for injection, fault injection. And these two were the ones that required uh, many, many, uh, or a lot of work on the, on the Zen side and the uh, lib uh, VMI. Okay. Making Zen even friendlier. Yes, it's possible. It's possible to make Zen even friendlier with HVI. And one of the things that we had, and unfortunately, or fortunately, it was merged into Zen just before we could put the presentation up, was the single step mechanism that we used for some time, to, for some time before it uh, was even implemented in Zen using uh, monitor trap flag and EPT switching. Uh, to improve performance and to gain uh, more stability uh, in the hypervisor. Now, there is still one thing that uh, can be added, at least one thing, that's uh, subpage uh, permissions. It's new. It's available in uh, Intel uh, processors that are designed for servers. Uh, but we had uh, the opportunity to work with such a uh, processor and uh, we add support for uh, SPP in Napoca that can be adapted in Zen also. Why would we do that? Well, we know that we can use EPT to enforce access rights on a guest physical address, and we can control what the guest can do on a uh, page, on a memory page. Uh, we can say that uh, a page is accessible for, accessible for read or write or execute or whatever else uh, we can uh, think of. And violating those access rights will generate an exit and we can take appropriate uh, measures. One drawback is that granularity of access rights can be done only on a page size. And the smaller page size is four uh, kilobytes. Interesting is that um, it generates a lot of exits and the uh, memory area that we are interested in monitoring is, is, is in general less than a page size, less than four kilobytes. And we need required uh, final granularity for uh, setting uh, and enforcing access rights on pages, on, on memory. 
Subpage write permission is something that can be activated on demand by the HVI engine or by a client. It's not always on. It can be turned on or off as required. And it's based on the master EPT tables that uses a four kilobytes page frames. New tables are created for uh, this feature and are populated accordingly to the requirements and access rights that we want to set on each memory region. And also in the v VMCS, we set uh, whatever fields is needed uh, in order to activate this, uh, this uh, feature. Any EPT violation that occurs is forwarded to the HVI engine to be examined and the uh, responses are treated accordingly by the hypervisor. So all that is left in case that things go wrong is that uh, the hypervisor has to handle the CPP, SPP related uh, uh, exits like, like misses or misconfiguration of uh, SPP feature. In general, as I said, uh, using the EPT, we can set uh, protection or uh, uh, access uh, restrictions on a memory page. The relevant location might be of 64 bytes, for example. And in the same page with the relevant memory location, we may find some OS counter variable that OS uh, increments uh, very often, causing a lot of irrelevant exits that we are not interested in. This in interested, this exit give an, an performance impact that uh, we would like to, to avoid. Now using SPP, we get a protected area of 128 bytes. It's a lot less, it, it, it's, it's less than, uh, than uh, a page size. And in this case, we can also protect the, 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 the interesting or relevant memory location uh, at the finer granularity. So the number of exits that we will have, the irrelevant exits will be less smaller. As a uh, test and a validation of these uh, things, we added uh, support in the Napoca hypervisor and in the introspection to protect some of the kernel structures that are sm pretty small. And we selected the fast IO dispatch table and the HAL dispatch table. We selected the, the Windows 10 uh, versions from RS1 through RS5, and uh, we benchmarked the behavior with SPP and without SPP. And the results are quite interesting. As you can see, the number of exits caused by the misses of the interesting data structure is quite high. Using SPP, we can reduce by quite impressive percent the number of exits. In worst case, we had a 37% reduction rate. And in the best case, we have a 99.99 uh, reduction rate. So given this, uh, these numbers and not only this, uh, this information, we consider that SPP is something that uh, needs to be included into Zen mainstream uh, releases as a performance improvement and also as a stability uh, factor. Regarding the future use cases, what we have in mind, what we have in plan is to build a community around this and see uh, the ideas that are generated also by the community. We have uh, in mind use cases for ATMs. Uh, we have in mind cases for um, uh, POS. We have in mind cases for this kind of devices that uh, are low on resources and the actions are like uh, controllable and does not require many many um, many things to be in place on that on, on that side okay uh, i went quite fast through the slides but if there are in questions or things that are unclear and would like to to answer, we are here to answer.
I think that an answer to this question depends very much on the priorities that we will have and the amount of requests that we get, we, we get from the community. If the community really asks for such a support, we can consider, but it depends, it depends. I suppose one other thing um, to say at this point is that anyone who's interested in subpage protection, um, this has been something that's been working on for a fair while now. Uh, it's also interesting to look at the current Intel ISA extensions guidelines to look at uh, a feature called HLAT, uh, which is also something that was worked on uh, for reasons around this area um, with uh, some further improvements for re removing VM exits. I think at this point we really should hand over to the next people, though, because we're two minutes over. Yeah, they've already switched in the other room. Okay, thanks everyone, and sorry for the for the delay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.